Global Civil War of the Third Millennium Throughout history, countries, nations, and empires have been wracked by civil war. Some were personal, like the wars between a king's sons or between personal armies. Most were class warfare based on economic injustices, Roman social wars, Cromwell's Commonwealth, American Civil War, Russian Civil War, Spanish Civil War, and all of the African Tribal Wars. The personal civil wars tended to have civilians as bystanders. Worse are the economic civil wars, which pitted whole segments of civilization against other segments. The American Civil War was an economic civil war, which pitted brother against brother. Sherman's march to the sea was civil warfare based on destroying an enemy's civilian economy. Thanks to unreasoned globalization and unearned wealth, humanity is in the early stages of a global civil war that has the vestiges of a personal civil war, e.g., Saddam tried to kill my daddy. In fact, the growing turmoil is a classical class struggle on a scale unprecedented in scope, global. Analogies to the American Civil War reveal new meaning to events that seem unrelated. Bloody Kansas echoes today in many lands, Palestine, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Philippines. In Looks and Lives, John Brown and Osmond Bin Laden shared more than Bloody Kansas and Taliban a Afghanistan. Brown's terrorist act at Harper's Ferry in 1859 was the September 11th of its day. One big difference, John Brown was caught and hung not aided and abetted. While both Brown and Bin Laden were wrong in their ways, they were not totally wrong in their motivation. Abolitionists protested against slavery. Anti-globalists protest against the same thing. Note, this writer in all his works is against all forms of slavery, economic, political, and religious. As he would cut the throat of a Hitler or Stalin at their birth, so does he feel the same towards the Saddams and Bin Ladens of the world. In the developing global civil war, the Fort Sumner attack was repeated on Iraq. False reasons and demands, which changed with each new paper headline. Shat. In both cases, the loser was surrounded and on starvation rations. Shat. In both cases, a little more time would have brought surrender. Shat. In both cases, the habitual politicians. Hell bent on economic plunder needlessly shed the blood of good soldiers. As the South secessionists cemented a coalition of northeastern and northwestern states to save the Union, the unnecessary Iraq attacks created unified hostility in the old world and created universal jihad in the Islamic world. With only one and a half exceptions, the Bush Hitters Coalition of the Willing. While the South had the military, had the might military, military advantage, advantage in minds and material, the today. wrongness of the Southern causes was an internal cancer. Of course, these Southern gentlemen broke their oaths with the United States of America and stole the material from the United States of America. Why did the Bush Hitters think they had the right to run roughshod over a reality? America's oil-obsessed politicians have misused America's military might, creating an internal cancer that will make Iraq a Pyrrhic victory. Iraq. Did the U.S. victory accelerate or decelerate the global civil war? Whereas previously millions of Iraqis went to work and occasionally attended a chest-pounding political rally, now to the forefront has come the principle of idle minds of the workshop of the devils. Millions of Iraqis will increasingly be saying, Thanks for getting rid of Saddam, but where's the beef? Did you save Iraq by destroying the Iraqi people? Behind the idle minds working for the devil are the added minds of economists working for politicians. More specifically, civil collapse in Iraq is Afghanistan all over again, with the eventual public order coming from new warlords, a new set of Saddams. If you don't have a plan for capitalizing a nation, it's best not to destroy its feeble system. Analogous situations are the Wall Street decapitalists who use leverage buyouts to destroy companies and jobs in a few weeks that had taken and will take years to create. Analogous are faith-based initiatives that put churches in charge of society's 
which then fell apart. Analogous are the guerrillas who can overthrow but not run a government. Analogous are the bullies who taunt little kids with, there is no Santa Claus. Civil unrest results. Before the American Civil War, ships were jammed with captured slaves. The pending global civil war has ships jammed with economic slaves. Before the American Civil War, dead plantation masters left their states of money and bodies. Today, the tax laws give spoiled brats. They don't solve any problems. The money and power to buy as many bodies as they want for worker sex. The no-death tax for 1% of the population increases the living tax on the middle class, who will be worked to death. Prior to the American Civil War, the plantation masters had mammies to take care of their kids. Today, their equivalents have nannies. Both mammies and nannies often suffer separation from their own kids to nurse their master's brood or curse their master's bed. One of the greatest tragedy of slavery was the destruction of the family unit. Masters proclaiming to each other their great hospitality, their conservative values, their deep compassion, and their strong families. Throughout history, slavery has been a form of legal prostitution which have abolitionists abhorred before the Civil War. Today, the global Civil War is being fueled by the anger in the hearts of the brothers as they see jet planes and loading tourists on sex junkets to buy a whore, their sister. As the institutions of slavery led up to the American Civil War, with racist attitudes resurfacing afterwards in Jim Crow laws, so has the modern-day plantation masters enacted patriot laws to deny freedom to the classes who have to work for a living. The old racist raving the white sheet of states' rights has become the new racist raving the red, right, and blue code of uh, the American way of life. Part of the legacy freezing each side on the slavery prior to the Civil War was the Dred Scott decision. The Supreme Court reversed Congress and the Constitution to disenfranchise a man that the laws of the country and of God said was free. In the year 2000, the U.S. Supreme Court again violated the Constitution to a greater degree by disenfranchising millions of citizens. Both decisions, in and of themselves, did not precipitate the coming civil conflict, but they sure did throw wood on the smoldering fires of hate. Then, as now, too many boys end up in civil wars and lost graves. Then, as now, the media put the power of the press behind money rather than freedom. Harper's Weekly was a journal of civilization like Roman democracy for the rich and the few. Roman democracy was the model for the U.S. Constitution. Both were called republics because democracy was limited to the rich landed pubes, race pubis, republic. And where was the wealth inherited most in antebellum days? Below the Mason-Dixon line, in the land of cotton. On one side, the global civil war will have today's rich pubes with their inherited unearned wealth. On the other side will be the masses of everyday problem solvers who yearned to earn an honest, full wage. Plantation masters wanted to protect the Southern way of life. Today, rich pews proclaim protection of the American way of life, like giving candy to a diabetic. One American casualty of the global civil war will be the Democratic Party, an organization focused on ideas. It is the Whig Party of today, deathly ill awaiting a mortician and the Republican Party of today has become the Democratic Party of 1860. Like Jesus, Lincoln would not be a party to a rich pube bush. Like an ember in a drought-stricken forest, this global civil war will combine the worst of 1860 and 1914. In 1865, the southern aristocracy was destroyed, gone with the wind. In 1918, at the end of the First World War, the British Empire was left alone. For the last was seen of the German, Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires. What did the South have in common with the 1914 vanquished, vanished vanities? Economic and political systems grounded on unearned, inherited wealth and power. Symbols and show, not substance and grit. What is the lesson of the 1914 empty erstwhile empires? 
The privileged rich uses the power to get more wealth from the basic problems of us, who eventually unite to dethrone and destroy the upper thieving class. The pure rich empires of today grow fat on the sweat and bread of the working class, the fuel of civil wars. Look at the Bush and Rich pubes, congressional legislation for tax and business benefits. Look at the origin and philosophy of, of the compassionate conservatives. Deep South Ku Klux Klan. Look at the primary beneficiaries of faith-based initiatives. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant churches. No better numbers show the enslavement of the working problem solvers than the increased unearned ownership of America by the top 1%. The shift in ownership from 20 to 50% in only 20 years did not come from the richest 1% producing more goods and services to solve the problems of America. The increased ownership of land, retirement, education, safety, and health care came from compassionate conservatives helping habitual politicians solve the problems of re-election for a few pieces of silver that brought gold coins of tax and business benefits. This is the crux of the developing global civil war. International and domestic financial schemes have concentrated the wealth into the hands of fewer and fewer players. This unearned wealth creates a molten mass of angry, seething problem solvers who will unite one day to settle the score.